Hello everyone and welcome to this month's WorkRight webinar on driver safety and ergonomics. Thanks so much for those of you who um, were expecting it to be last Friday. Hopefully you would have all got the message that we had to reschedule and so thank you very much for turning up today. Um, I'm Chris Jones, Technical Director at Posturite. Uh, as usual, Ellie joins me and even better news, we have a special guest uh, today. <laughs> Light relief from the, from the normal conversations that Ellie and I have. Um, so this is Debbie Pettit, who uh, started working with us at Posture in July 2008. So coming up to 10 years. Um, previously, she was a chartered physiotherapist in the NHS. Now she is a consultant trainer, and she helps us develop and deliver our DSE and manual handling courses. She's also a lead trainer in first aid for us. She also conducts specialist DSE and driver comfort assessments, which is one of the reasons that Debbie is joining us today. How are you, Debbie? I'm very well indeed, thank you. That was a very Good big thanks. up um, introduction. Thank you for that, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Ellie. How are you today, Ellie? Yep. Very well, thanks very much. Super. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Um, first off, before I start showing you our driver awareness course, um, I just wanted to ask you, with our first poll, um, how many of you guys drive as part of your job? So, for work or as, as part of your job? So, if you can just answer, do you drive for work as part of your job? Because I know that I do, and Deb, you do too as well, don't you? Yeah, ridiculous amount. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you drive? Do you reckon you drive every day to various locations? Um, pretty much. Although, generally speaking, uh, where possible, I work from home on a Friday. Um, as um, all our listeners will know, driving anywhere on a Friday is an absolute nightmare, particularly getting home from anywhere on a Friday. Absolutely. How big is your territory that you look after? Like, how 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 kind of far are you nationwide. going? Nationwide. I'm nationwide. Really? England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales, and I've been as far as. Switzerland with the company so far, but that's quite it's unusual, awesome. and I didn't drive. <laughs> drove all the way there. How are we doing, Chris? Is everyone Excellent. else? Ne nearly everybody has voted now, so I will, um, I will close the polls, and I will share it to everybody. So, as we can see, 79% yeah. of uh, those of you who have attended today are drive as part of your job. So, those guys that do drive, if you can just have a think about <clears throat> what sort of kind of training that you've been given um, as I go through the course? Um, we'd be interested to get your feedback on it if and if any of it's been a helpful reminder to you, um, a little bit of a refresher training. Uh, so what will you learn as I take you through this course? It's designed to help employees and companies comply with the legal requirement to manage work-related road safety. It offers useful guidance about how to reduce risks associated with work-related car journeys. It also enables employees to participate effectively in measures to reduce the risks to which they might be exposed on the roads. In the UK, there's a legal requirement for employers to manage the health and safety of their staff, and this includes on the road, and there will always be a moral obligation for the same. For the majority of people, the most dangerous thing they do while at work is to drive on the public highway. Um, so excluding commuting, how many of the miles driven on Britain's roads are work-related, do you reckon? What are you going for, Debs? What do you think? We'll open up the poll to, the poll to everyone. I would, I would say 50%. Hmm. Do you reckon? I, I actually think possibly. It might even be more than that, but, um, but I would go with 50%. You reckon? Mm -hmm. What do you reckon, Chris? Um, oh, I, I, I have to put a hands up here, and I actually know the answer because it's written in front of me, so I, I, I'm not going to participate. I could, usually I try and hide them before launching it, but I just can't do that today. So. <laughs> <laughs> Best, you're being honest, Chris. <laughs> exactly. I just thought, uh, I'm either going to deliberately get it wrong, which I don't like to do, or, um, or, or uh, so yeah, so, um, so I'm going to refrain, Ellie. Real. Okay. Um, Come on, Ellie, what's your guess? Is anyone... Has yeah. anyone answered? Yeah. I'm going to say 25%. Okay. okay. Cool. So let's have a look. So it looks like everyone followed your lead there, Debbie, and we had a, 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 an out. 80% uh, of us uh, thought that 50% of us, 50% um, uh, of the miles driven on Britain roads are work related. But mm -hmm. is that true, Ellie? Uh, let's have a look. 50%. It's incorrect, guys. Excluding oh, commuting, approximately 25% of miles driven on UK's roads are for work purposes only. Okay. Let's go through. 
So every week there are around 20 fatalities and 250 serious injuries in the UK involving someone driving for workers. Pretty sobering thought. Statistically, one in three collisions involves at least one vehicle being driven for or at work, and these deaths and injuries are preventable. Drivers whose work-related journeys accounted for 1 to 80% of their total mileage had, on average, 13% more injury collisions than non-work drivers that were oh, otherwise yeah. similar in terms of age, sex and mileage. Company drivers that drive more than 80% of their annual mileage on work-related journeys have over 50% more injury collisions than non-work drivers doing similar mileage. Have you had a crash, Deb, while you were driving for work? Has it ever happened to you? Um, I've I've had a lady that ran into the back of me um, at traffic lights on my first anniversary with posturite. Oh, really? Oh, in fact, no. it's a bad day all round because I fractured a tooth at the same time. Well, not at the same time as the accident, but earlier in the day. Oh, right. It, was, it, um, but it always wor worries it, me how many... Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, everything was fine. It was just, you know, like she obviously thought that I moved forward um, after the car in front of me, and I hadn't. But you know, there was no, there was no damage, minimal scratches to the cars and what have you, but no personal injury damage at all. Yeah, it always worries me when I'm driving, say, on the M25, how many, how many flashing lights I see, how many incidents I see, and yeah, that, that's always my the kind of sobering reminder. Yeah. yeah. Um, so going back to the course, companies are legally required to manage a driving for work policy under uh, health and safety legislation and road traffic law. Road collisions involving work-related journeys may result in company management and employees being prosecuted even when drivers are using their own vehicle. It's difficult to calculate the true costs of work-related road collisions due to the hidden costs that may, may occur, but how, many, how much is the estimated yearly cost of collisions involving work-related vehicles do we reckon? We'll open it up. Is it 1.4 billion, 2.4 billion, 3.4 billion, or 4.4 billion? I mean, whichever one you pick, it's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. Yeah, that, that's a certain number I can't really comprehend, so it's a, it, it's a bit of a stab in the dark yeah. for me. And I've turned my paper over this time, so I don't know <laughs> the answer. So. Excellent. <laughs> the, the way I approach multiple questions like this is I'll probably go for the top one and take one off. So I'm going to go 3.4 billion. Fair enough. Deb, what do you reckon? I'm going to go 1.4 billion. Right, yeah. And what did our guys think? 2.4 billion. Okie doke. So I'll go with the majority. Guys, that's incorrect. Collisions incorrect. involving work related vehicles are estimated to cost society a total of 4.4 billion each year. The estimated cost to employers is 2.7 billion per year, according to the Health and Safety Executive. Crikey. What a that's lot of money. Phenomenal. And can so easily be avoided if you give your staff the right awareness tools. Um, it's difficult. Oh, hang on. We've just read you that bit. Research examining workplace accidents suggests that for one pound recovered through insurance, between eight and thirty-six pounds may be lost via uninsured costs. Uninsured costs associated with work-related collisions can include the loss of company reputation and contracts, replacement staff costs and sick pay, excess on a claim accident investigation and paperwork, and management and administrative time. Research shows that a company can realise a number of benefits by managing work-related um, safety, no matter the company size. Benefits include fewer days lost due to injury, reduced work-related illness, reduced stress and improved morale, lower insurance premiums, and fewer vehicles off the road for repair. So we're going to go through a bit of a case study here now, guys. James had started a job at a sales company. His job requires him to drive to visit the company's different sites and attend meetings with clients. The company has informed him that it takes the management of work-related road safety very seriously and that there is some information that he must be aware of before he starts his job. The company also provides James with a copy of its road safety policy. James knows that the company is legally required to manage work-related road safety, but surely this is just a formality. Which of the following is a key benefit for the company of managing work-related road, work road safety? Is it an increase in private vehicles used for work? Or is it a reduction in the number of fleet management staff required? Or is it few work days lost due to injury? Or is it all of the above? So what are your thoughts, Deb? 
I'm going to go with less time off work due to injury. And Ellie? I wrote this. <laughs> well, um, I, I think I'd agree with, uh, with with you, Debbie. I think that's um, uh, it's got 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 to be one of the key benefits. What does yeah. the poll say? Yeah, absolutely. Let's have a look. So the polls the polls agree with us. Eighty one percent are in agreement with us, Debbie. So um, and and Ellie, Thank let's you. have a look. What the that answer is, correct, is guys well done a key benefit for the company is fewer work days lost due to injury other benefits can include the reduced work related illness reduced stress lower insurance premiums and fewer fewer vehicles off the road for repair the risks associated with driving are significant and must be taken seriously the management of work related road safety is a legal requirement and has significant commercial benefits Now we're going to go on to the driver theory. Companies and employees can be prosecuted for road collisions in which the driver is driving for work. Even if the driver is using their own vehicle, which was a fact that I didn't know before I started Apostra, I didn't know that at all. Um, Work-related road safety is a shared responsibility between the employer and the employee. So let's have a look at which legislation applies to work-related road safety, the Health and Safety at Work Act. As employers have a duty of care for the safety of employees at work, irrespective of the type or size of the business. And employers have a duty of care to others that may be affected by their business activities, which in the case of driving means all other road users. The management of health and safety at work regulations. Employers have a responsibility to manage health and safety effectively. They are required to assess the risk to the health and safety of employees and implement necessary measures to reduce this risk. Employers must periodically review their risk assessments to ensure they remain appropriate. Employers must appoint competent people to drive and ensure they are supported by appropriate training. I think that fact's quite important. The road traffic law, supported by the Highway Code, which includes information on signs and markings, road users, um, the law and the driving penalties. It's an offence for a company to set driver schedules that cause employees to break the speed limit or other road and traffic laws. Employees must always follow the Highway Code. The Corporate Manslaughter and Corporate Homicide Act 2007, which introduces an important new section for certain serious senior management failures that result in a fatality. It's your responsibility to comply with traffic legislation when driving. You must ensure that you hold a current driving license for the class of vehicle you're driving and carry this license when driving a company vehicle. You need to notify your supervisor or manager immediately if your driving license is suspended or cancelled or if any other limitations are placed on it. Commuting is not covered by the health and safety laws unless the employee is travelling from their home to a location that's not their usual place of work. If your company employs five or more people, it must have a written health and safety policy. A road safety policy may also be written as a standalone document or as part of the health and safety policy. The road safety policy should be reviewed regularly to ensure it complies with the current legal requirements. It must include consultation and ownership details. It must be communicated and explained to staff so that the expectations are clear. It must provide information on performance indicators and include information for third parties that drive for the business where applicable. It must include minimum requirements for drivers like the training and the license types. It's important that you read through your company's health and safety or road safety policy and contact your supervisor or manager if you've got any questions. Risk assessment is vital to protect employees and the company and to comply with the law as it helps you identify the risk level for any potential hazards. Risk assessments for work-related safety identify the risks associated with the driver, vehicles and the journey. The assessment examines whether the company has done enough to ensure safe working practice, whether more is required to prevent harm. The overall aim is to reduce the risk of someone being injured or killed. And you need to be aware of the hazards that should be risk assessed. So what are the hazards that need to be identified? The vehicle. Is it suitable for purpose? The maintenance scheduling, distractions like sat-nav, what load is being carried, the safety rating for cars, um, insurance and MOT. Um, what are the other hazards? Relating to the journey, you need to consider the length of the journey, 
the type of roads, the time of travel, the weather conditions and the speed limits. Now, me personally, I take this into consideration every every journey, every time I drive for work um, and every time I drive in general now because if I were to lose my license, I'd, my, I wouldn't be able to do my job anymore. Um, and also hazards relating to the driver themselves, so their age, driving experience, their competence and attitude to driving the familiarity that they have with the vehicle and the route that they're traveling on, their health and fitness, their stress levels are something to consider, the likelihood of fatigue, alcohol and drugs, and distractions like mobile phones. Well, with the new the new penalties coming in for mobile phones, something we all need to be aware yeah, of. Absolutely. That, was, down. that was Wednesday, wasn't it? It came into force. Yeah. Um, employers can help to reduce risks identified in the risk assessment by avoiding journeys where possible, for example, using video conferencing facilities. It's something we do quite a lot here. Avoid the journeys if we can. And planning safer journeys. Ensuring appropriate vehicles are selected and that maintenance is undertaken. And selecting appropriate drivers. Another case study with good old James. In preparation for an upcoming work trip, James takes a few minutes to review his company's road safety policy. He considers using his own vehicle for his work-related trip as he believes his company could not be prosecuted for road collisions if he drives his own vehicle for work. Is this true or false? Okay, what do we think? Debbie, what false. do you think? And own false on that one. Yeah, I think so. Did everyone else go the same? So we've had, yeah, lots of people have voted so far, so I think we'll, we'll close that now and let's have a look. So 99% yeah. false there, and um, perhaps uh, one one person thinking not. So let's have a let's have a look. We don't that know. Correct. Well done. Companies and employees can be prosecuted for road collisions where the driver's driving for work, even if the driver's using their own vehicle. So, in summary. We've provided you with information about the legal requirements. If your company employs more than five people, it must have a written health and safety policy. Risk assessments for work-related road safety uh, identify the risks associated with the vehicle, the journey, and the driver. And there are a number of ways to minimize work-related road safety hazards. The first factor to be considered is whether the journey can be avoided. Now we're moving on to driver safety. So researchers identified a number of key risk factors that makes driving for work riskier than other types of driving, such as fatigue, distractions, and time pressure. In other words, mm -hmm. when driving for work, drivers are more likely to suffer from fatigue, distractions, or time pressure than when they're doing other types of driving. And it's important to understand these key risk factors in order to try and reduce their impact on your driving. So fatigue and sleepiness. A fatigued or sleepy driver is an unsafe driver. Sleepiness and fatigue are related, but are subtly different. Sleepiness is simply having difficulty remaining awake, while fatigue is the gradual loss of efficiency. The driving situations in which drivers are most likely to fall asleep at the wheel are between midnight and 6 a.m. and between 2 p.m. and 4 p.m. That afternoon time is a killer for me. That Literally, that is when my eyes start closing and I need to get up and jump around the car. Um, on long journeys with monotonous roads, motorways, M25, um, after yeah. having less sleep than normal, after taking medicine that causes drowsiness, and on mm -hmm. journeys home after night shifts or after being awake for a long time. So, Deb, you must feel that when you've, if you've had an early start <laughs> and an, an, an early start and yeah, a late back. Yeah, some of those starts are ridiculously early. <laughs> Fatigued and sleepy, dan uh, sleepy dancers, sleepy drivers start making safety critical errors long before they reach the stage of falling asleep at the wheel. Driving for long periods will make you fatigued and more likely to make mistakes. So what can you do to tackle fatigue? Consider the possibility of fatigue when selecting a mode of transport. Consider alternative modes of transport. Don't drive the car. Rest adequately when you're not at work. Review your schedule for work and discuss any issues with management and ensure you have overnight stays when it's necessary. It's important to take regular breaks from driving and get out of the vehicle during these breaks. This will help reduce fatigue. How many minutes break should be taken for every two hours of driving? Do we know this? Well, I, think it's, I think it's 15 minutes. I'm pretty sure I've heard that many times before. 
Yeah, um, yeah, I, I would but, agree with that, although I think that's not long enough. And I don't but, think, really? generally speaking, we shouldn't be driving for two hours, full stop anyway, but I know people do, me included. Do, don't they? Yeah, when you, you're, you're so nearly, when you're 40 miles from home and you're stuck in traffic and Absolutely. you think. Absolutely, it, it does tend to be when you're driving home, you just want to yeah. get there, particularly if the roads are clear. It's just not worth taking the risk though, is it, for the sake yeah, of getting out and having a cup of tea? And, and Debbie, what what do you do when you're having a break? Um, I will. I always get out of the car, um, but I appreciate that you know if you happen to be parked on the M25 because let's face it, it's more of a car park than it is a motorway. Um, it's not that easy to get out of the vehicle, but there's, you can do stretches and what have you in the vehicle um, just to you know brighten yourself up a little bit. Maybe not to the extent of leaping about, Ellie, but you know. You've got the right idea. <laughs> I, I, you'll always see me at a service station running around the car, literally running. But sometimes star jumps. I sing, I sing a lot in the car. That keeps me awake. You, you what, sorry? I sing. Yeah, that too. <laughs> Blaring along to the classics. So what's That's everyone said? Okay, let's have a look. So 74% at 15 minutes, 23 at 10 minutes, 3% at a 5 minute, quick 5 minute break and... Um, Zero minutes doesn't really count as a break, so um, uh, I'm no, glad nobody's good. picked that. Um, anyway, so um, let's uh, let's have a look, Elliot. Um, oh, you've clicked it already. So yes, 15 minutes is is the one. But um, as you said, yeah. Debbie, perhaps perhaps that should be longer if possible it's as well. Longer. Yeah, absolutely. Sleep's required to reduce sleepiness. Rest is not enough. You should ensure you're getting a good quality sleep. If you start to feel sleepy, you should find somewhere safe to stop and have a cat nap for 15 minutes. Fatigue is a typical symptom of stress. A total of 10.4 million working days were lost due to stress, depression and anxiety in the UK in 2011 to 12. Due to job demands and organisational structure. Lack of control or involvement. Work-life balance. Domestic issues and the hours spent driving. Mm -hmm. So what can you do to tackle stress? Allow for delays when planning and scheduling journeys. Arrange a meeting with your supervisor or line manager if you identify problems that may affect your driving, because obviously no manager is going to want you to take any risks. And ask mm -hmm. your supervisor or manager if there is additional support for staff. A driver is distracted when they have to pay attention to a second activity while driving. We're not, we're not counting singing along to the radio. Um, with this, <laughs> Possible distractions while driving include mobile phones, just leave it alone. Passengers, eating and smoking. It's important that you identify possible distractions before driving and take measures to avoid them in order to reduce your risk of being involved in a collision. Mobile phones. You're breaking the law if you pick up and use any type of phone that is or must be held to operate it. You'll receive a £100 fine and three penalty points on your licence, which is due to be updated. Indeed. Uh, yeah. A handheld mobile phone is defined as a device other than a two-way radio which performs an interactive communication function by transmitting and receiving data. So this includes sending or receiving voice or text messages, sending or receiving documents, sending or receiving still or moving images, and accessing the internet. The two exceptions are a two-way press-to-talk radio or in a genuine emergency using a handheld phone to dial 999 if it's unsafe for the driver to stop. Uh, I still can't believe how many people upload pictures of traffic jams or videos of themselves whilst driving or singing along. But like I see it on Facebook with people that I know and just think you absolute idiots. Why Absolutely. do it? Why take yeah. the risk? Yeah. Um, so a recent uh, recent research shows that using a mobile phone reduces driver awareness, increases reaction times, obviously because you're distracted, um, may mm -hmm. cause the driver to fail to see road signs or, or maintain a proper lane position if you're busy tweeting where you are or your traffic jam, um, and increases the risk of crashing by four times. Do you think that using a hands-free device significantly reduces the risk? Should we open up that poll? I always thought it did, because I think if you can... Look, it's not illegal for you to change your CD, is it? You can still do that. Um, <coughs> no, but it is distracting. Yeah. Um, even if you're only taking your eyes off the mode for a second, 
I've got inbuilt hands-free in the car. It's Bluetooth. It's all connected up. But I infrequently take calls when I'm driving. Because well, I've got to concentrate on, on the person at the other end of the phone. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I think that's part of the difference between having a passenger, which can still be distra distracting, but talk yeah. that and talking on the phone is the person on the other end of the phone has got no idea of what's going on in the car for you, so Absolutely. they can't react with you. So they carry on talking. Um, yeah. Meanwhile, chaos could be ensuing in front of you. So, um, Absolutely. Okay, so let's have a look. What did everybody say? No. So let's mm. go with the majority. It's correct. Using a hands-free device doesn't significantly reduce the risks. It's because the important effects of distraction are related to its impact on thinking and decision-making. Research shows clearly that your driving will suffer as will your ability to hold the conversation. And passengers also act as a distraction from driving. It's essential that you keep the distraction caused by passengers to a minimum. So consider restricting the transport of passengers to only those who are essential for the journey. I rarely have any passengers while I'm driving for work. It tends just to be me. Mm -hmm. and my dad. Um, ensure passengers are aware of their responsibilities to follow instructions and not cause unnecessary distraction. And let passengers know if they're distracting you. Tell them to be quiet. Stop doing what they're doing. <laughs> um, smoking. Now, even when I was a smoker, I could never smoke while driving. I just couldn't. The thought of having a lit, fiery object whilst I'm driving a car, I, just, I can't understand why anyone would do it. It's crazy. So the activity of lighting and smoking a cigarette, cigar or pipe will reduce driver concentration due to the mental and physical distractions involved. The mental distraction is due to finding and lighting the cigarette and the physical distraction occurs as the driver has had to use at least one hand to hold a cigarette. I've seen people roll cigarettes whilst they've been driving. Oh, mental. good grief. Ridiculous. <laughs> the highway code advises drivers not to smoke while driving. In the UK, there's legislation prohibiting smoking in enclosed workplaces, which applies to vehicles when being used for business purposes. But you yeah. still see people in work vans smoking cigarettes at you all the yeah. time. If you do smoke, wait until you've completed the journey and find a designated area before smoking. If you do need to smoke before then, ensure you find a safe place to stop. The activity of eating and drinking reduces driver concentration due to the mental and physical distraction involved. The mental distraction is finding the food and drink, and the physical distraction occurs as the driver has to use at least one hand to hold the food or drink. When you're planning your journey, ensure you have sufficient time that sufficient time has been allocated for refreshments. If required, take food and drink with you on the journey, but ensure you stop in a safe place before having a refreshment. I mean, I'm notoriously clumsy anyway, so I've never used the drinks holder. <laughs> my car one time just never do it I mean, I mean I did do it once actually um, but I didn't put my drinks in the holder I put my drink in the door which obviously resulted in a oh. latte fiasco oh fiasco. Um, lovely again, <laughs> never. so time pressure and speeding your company doesn't tolerate speeding its policy will state that drivers must always comply with the speed limits driving at inappropriate speeds on work related journeys is the key risk factor for driving for work it includes exceeding the speed limit and driving too fast for the conditions. High speed driving reduces the time available to identify and react to what's happening and it increases the time it takes to stop the vehicle. Other driver errors are magnified while speeding such as close following which increases the risk of collision. It's important that you drive appropriate and legal speeds at all times and that you keep a safe distance from the other vehicles. So the safe distance, travel distance, between vehicles driving in dry conditions is distance travelled in two seconds. I always remember this from my driving lessons, actually. Only it's a fool breaks the two-second rule. That's right, yeah. We all remember that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what's the safe distance in wet weather? What do we reckon? Well, I, I think ice and snow is something like 10 seconds is it yeah um, yeah yeah i'm sure i'm sure yeah. it might be might, might might be that high and even then you can um it's fairly unpredictable and now wet we know wet is more slippery than dry and probably i'm going to say it's not going to be three versus two so um i'm going to go with four what does I everybody reckon yeah they answered let's have a look look at that 97 percent say four <laughs> seconds well so, done, guys. Um, well, I'm guessing 
Oh, yeah, there we go. Yeah, there we go. The equivalent to 110 metres if you're driving at 70 miles per hour. Drivers sometimes exceed the speed limit without realising, and it's not an excuse. Developments in vehicle technology have resulted in powerful and comfortable vehicles that provide little sensation of speed. Check your speedometer regularly, especially when you're using different types of roads. Ensure you know the limit for the road. Look out for signs. Assume lampposts mean, mean 30 miles per hour, unless a sign says otherwise. For example, it may be less, 20 miles. Um, acknowledge that speed limits are a maximum, not a target. If children are around, 20 miles per hour might be an appropriate speed and even may be too fast. Recognise what makes you speed, keeping up with traffic, overtaking and being tailgated. Um, and plan your journey so you have plenty, time, plenty of time to arrive at the required destination. I mean, anyone's going to rather you be late than break the speed limit um, yeah. and put yourself at risk. So now what's James doing? He's planning a trip from the London office to Manchester. His sat navs calculated that the trip will take three and a half hours. He's keen to avoid the morning rush, so he plans to leave at 6 a.m. His meeting's planned at 9.30 a.m. Oh, James. Uh, he's <laughs> installed a hands-free phone in the company car. This will allow him to manage a couple of morning conference calls while driving. He goes to bed early and he feels confident he's planned a safe road trip, but has he? Which of the following risks has he neglected to account for? Is it distractions, time pressure, fatigue, or all of them? I think we know the answer to that, don't we? I think James has not, not, not planned this journey particularly well. I think he's not tried so hard. hard. He's and, tried so uh, hard. He's got up very early, but I think actually he might have needed to set the alarm a little bit earlier than that to, uh, yeah, to, to, absolutely. to, to fit this all in. Or um, plan the meeting a bit later. Yeah. That's what I would have done, for sure. Okay. As everyone said. Let's have a look. So yeah, so 91%, all of the above. Uh, we did have um, a, a, a splattering of different answers as well. So time pressure was uh, at 5%, and he certainly was being all pressured of the above. Time. So, um, which is correct, guys. Well done. Because he hasn't allowed for any breaks, and even though he's had a good night's sleep, it's likely to make him fatigue driving for three hours, and also the time that he's woken up. 6 a.m., practically the middle of the night. Um, he's put himself That's under time lying. pressure. <laughs> he's put himself <laughs> under time pressure as he hasn't allowed for any delays. And taking calls is a distraction. His morning calls yeah. are likely to coincide with him navigating rush hour traffic in the Midlands. Mm -hmm. Oh, James, try harder. So, in summary, we've discussed fatigue, distractions, and time pressure. And these um, distractions outlined were mobile phones, passengers eating and drinking, sat-navs and smoking. And there's a number of ways to tackle fatigue, distractions and time pressure. The most important thing is to understand the key risks that influence your driving and take measures to reduce these. So now we're moving on to vehicle safety. Basic vehicle checks. It's your responsibility to ensure that the vehicle you use meets the minimum legal requirements. Flower. This is a simple way to remember the basic vehicle checks. So, the F stands for fuel. Ensure you've got enough fuel to reach your destination. Lights. Ensure all exterior lights are clean and check for blown bulbs and cracks in the lens. Oil. Check your oil level regularly. Water. Check your windscreen washer fluid and other fluid levels and fill up if required. Electrics. If a warning light is displayed when you start the car, this should be checked before undertaking the journey. When I very first got past my test and I got my very first car, I kept saying, oh, there's this little genie light that keeps going off on my, on my dashboard every time I turn a corner. What does that mean? I was thinking, what does that genie light mean? I'll tell you what that genie light means. I was out of oil and I burnt out the whole engine. So I had to buy a whole new engine for my brand new car. So you weren't frantically rubbing the steering wheel. <laughs> Trying to make a it. wish. Yeah. I'll tell you what, <laughs> living definitely was after I got that quote. What a ridiculous person. Um, and the R stands for rubber. Ensure the tyre pressure is correct and that the tyres have sufficient tread. You've got to be aware of the procedure for reporting vehicle defects at your company. You can find out um, the procedure for reporting those defects by looking at your company road safety policy, asking your supervisor or manager, and asking the transport manager if you have one. Vehicles must have adequate breakdown cover. Um, it must be adequate for its intended purpose and must not create a hazard. 
The vehicle should have a planned maintenance schedule based on time or distance. You are required to report any vehicle defects. If the defect is critical, the vehicle should not be driven. Which safety features do you think are required as a minimum for a company car? Is it head restraints, driver airbags, anti-lock brakes and seat belts for all the vehicle occupants? Um, is it a fire extinguisher, first aid kit, spare tyre and warning triangle? Is it all of the above? What do we reckon? All of the above. Yeah, the easy multiple choice answer there. I'd go with all of the above as well. What did everyone say? Looks like... Let's have a look. Everyone agreed. Thank you pretty much. And that's correct. Well done. You need to have them all. Under health and safety law, employers have the same duty of care for employees that drive their own vehicle for work as they do for those that drive company-owned, leased or hired vehicles. Privately owned vehicles must not be used for work purposes unless they're fit for purpose, are roadworthy, are insured for business use, have a valid MOT certificate, have regular service history according to the manufacturer's recommendations, have regular safety checks and pre-drive safety checks. You should be able to show on request documentary proof of the above. You must seek your employer's ag agreement before using your vehicle for work. You mustn't carry loads that are unsuitable um, or carry more passengers than there are seat belts. You mustn't use vehicles in conditions they weren't designed for. Regular inspections of private vehicles that are used for business purposes may be undertaken by your company. Safety equipment is essential to minimising the risk. A seat belt must be worn at all times by a driver or passenger. There are exceptions for wearing seat belts, including medical grounds certified by a doctor and delivery vehicles travelling a maximum of 50 metres between stops. I didn't know that about delivery drivers. Um, head restraints, which um, are designed to prevent whiplash in an event of a collision. You must adjust your head restraint so that the top is no lower than the top of your eyes and so that it's as close as possible when driving in a normal position. Ensure you adjust your head restraint before starting your journey. Very important. Ensure that your fire extinguishers in date you must know how to use your fire extinguisher. Contact your supervisor or manager if you require training. And a first aid kit. Ensure your vehicle contains one and that you know its location and that it's stored safely. Mine's in my boot. Yeah. Um, and a warning triangle. Ensure the vehicle contains one for emergency situations. It should be deployed no less than 45 metres from the vehicle if it's safe to do so. So now James has received a new company car and he checks some of the vehicle safety features. By law, which of the following features must the vehicle have? Is it, this is quite complicated guys, is it head restraints, airbags, anti-lock brakes and seat belts for all? Is it head, head restraints, airbags, a sat-nav system and seat belts for all? Is it airbags, anti-lock brakes or seat belts for all occupants and snow chains? What do we reckon? <laughs> well, I think it's going to depend slightly on which country you're in, because I think actually in some well, yeah, countries that's true. that does that does that does change a little bit. Um, but um, not, I don't think it's ever a requirement for sat nav, but certainly snow chains I think might be a requirement in some locations. Yeah. Um, so really, whether it's option one or or none in my mind, um, but um, I think I'm going to go with I'm going to go with head restraints, airbags, anti-lock brakes and seat belts. But is this, mm -hmm. I, I might have misunderstood the question, but is this for a company car or any car? Company car. Company car. Company car. Yeah. Or vehicle used for, for business. Okay. What did everyone say? Let's have a look. Yeah, everyone went there for the first go. one. And uh, let's have a look. Yep, as a minimum, the company car must have head restraints, airbags, at least for the driver, anti-lock brakes, and seat belts for all vehicle occupants. It's your responsibility to ensure that the vehicle you're about to use on the road meets the minimum legal requirements. It's making me think I definitely need to take my car in for a service. Um, this module has given you advice on the basic vehicle checks and safety linked to the company and private vehicles, safety equipment and reporting vehicle defects. It's your responsibility to ensure that the vehicle you're about to use meets the minimum legal requirements. You must be aware of the procedure for reporting vehicle defects and you must ensure the vehicle you take on the road has the appropriate safety equipment. Now we're going to have a look at journey planning. 
All journeys should be necessary, planned and management, managed. Where possible, eliminate or reduce journeys and mileage. Ask yourself the following questions before travelling on a work-related journey. What's the job that has to be done? Does this job really require a journey to be made? Is it possible to avoid the journey by use of other means, for example, telephone or video conferencing, email or other means of communication? If the journey is necessary, is it possible to use public transport for the journey? Me personally, I will never drive to central London. I will get the train every time. Every time. Wouldn't risk driving in that traffic. It's absolute mayhem. Um, planning all necessary journeys prior to departure will help to improve the efficiency of the company and ensure all journeys are completed as safe, safely as possible. Planning allows you to select safe schedules and identify the most efficient routes. Planning for work-related trips may be carried out by line managers, transport managers or drivers. When planning a work-related trip, you should consider your choice of route, your journey schedule and the weather conditions. Um, you should also consider the length, width and height of the vehicle, the road types, traffic densities, known hazards and an alternative route should there be any emergency situation. You should also consider speed limits, driving time, sharing the driver on the journey, getting adequate good, adequate good quality sleep, allowing time for unexpected delays, avoiding peak traffic hours, allowing time for regular breaks, allowing time for delays, listening to traffic news where possible, um, and avoiding nighttime driving if you can, and staying overnight if you need to. In the weather conditions, before you drive, make sure you check the weather conditions. Nighttime and adverse weather driving should be avoided. I will never drive in snow. Um, if these journeys can't be avoided, they should be adequately planned. If high winds have been predicted, avoid those routes with high level bridges. In winter, consider the possibility of becoming stranded and take appropriate precautions. Undertake the safety checks, as we've mentioned. Ensure that the lights and number plates are kept clean from snow and mud at all times. And ensure you've got sufficient levels of fuel to complete your journey and allow for detours if a problem should occur. Um, if you're required to travel in adverse weather conditions, make sure you have warm clothing, high energy food, a tow rope, grit, a de-icing fluid, an ice scraper, and a shovel. I don't have a shovel in my car. No, I don't must think have, I do. Must have a shovel in my car. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what's James doing now? Uh, he plans to attend a meeting that's a three-hour drive away. Rain. He's checked the weather forecast, and, and rain and snow, uh, neither of those has been forecast. Does he need to worry about weather conditions? Does he? Okay, yeah, I think he does. Morning, hey. They may change. He still needs to be aware. Mm -hmm. Are we going with yes? Okay, let's, uh, most people have voted by now, so let's close and share. And a fairly unanimous, uh -huh. completely unanimous, 100%. <laughs> yeah, uh, well done. You're right, Debs, because they, they might change. They might change. Yeah. Um, yeah. Especially British weather. Renowned, isn't it? Absolutely. Four seasons in a day. So all journeys should be planned. Try to avoid the journey if you can, and when planning a trip, you need to take into account the choice of route, uh, journey planning, and the weather conditions. And finally, what to do if you've had a crash. You must report all collisions that have occurred during work-related journeys, even if you own the car. Check the rules and procedures of your company that your company has for dealing with collisions and breakdown, and you must be aware of the legal requirements. So, what should companies a company vehicles carry as a minimum, they should carry a camera, a high-vis jacket, warning triangles, instructions on how to manage an incident scene, a collision report form, pen and pencil, an information sheet to exchange de details with third parties, details of who you must contact, details of the contact point with the company for reporting collisions. And what should you do if you're involved in a collision or breakdown? Touch wood hasn't happened. Everyone touch wood, so it doesn't happen. Um, avoid stopping in a dangerous place if possible. Don't remain in the vehicle if you've broken down on the motorway. Park uh, the vehicle well to the left on the hard shoulder and wait. Put the warning triangle on the same side of the road. If the vehicle's causing an obstruction, warn the traffic by using your hazard lights. 
Call breakdown services. Never attempt to fix the vehicle. Call the emergency services if you've been involved in a collision that obstructs the highway or, or ser is serious or involves injury and ensure you've followed the company's procedure for recording all the information about the collision. So on James's way home, he's involved in a collision on the motorway. No major damage is done, thank goodness, to any of the vehicles, but both drivers have stopped to assess the situation. What should James and the other driver do as they stop their vehicles on the road? Should they park the vehicle well to the left on the hard shoulder? Should they summon assistance and wait off the road behind the crash barrier? Should they warn other traffic by using their hazard lights? Um, or should they do it all? I think we know. Yeah. I agree, Elian. My memory is not too bad. I, I, I'm just taking what you just said, and I think that matches exactly that we should do all of the options. So, I th and I think it looks like everybody else is in agreement there. Let's have a look and share those results. Sure, yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Hundred percent. There we are. Absolutely, guys. Do it all. Don't risk leaving anything undone. You must report all collisions, even if you are using a private vehicle. Um, your company vehicle should have a number of items and ensure you're clear about the steps that you should take if you're involved in a collision. Um, so then on this uh, our driver awareness tool we've also got the option of an assessment. So you can assess how much your staff actually know. So it will go through driver theory. Have they read the company policy? When did you last read the highway code? Uh, some of our clients use this to tie in with driver's license checks um, and insurance documentation. So you know use their um, retraining notification on the work right system to also be your reminder that it's time to get uh, that important documentation. Um, and it will go through the sections as it has using post-collision. Do you know the rules and procedures? And as with all of our courses, this is completely configurable and customizable to your company. So chuck in as many HR policies and procedures as you can and really use this as a Bible for people's driver awareness linked to your own company. Um, so that's all from me. Um, I've totally shown you this course, but Deb, we just wanted to talk to you uh, quickly about um, driver ergonomics, and that mm -hmm. you, you can you can get really sore as well when you're driving for a long time. So have you got Absolutely. some of the exercises that you were mentioning to and stretches? Yeah, I, I think some people do um, naturally stretch, but they tend to stretch when they're sore rather than before they're sore, um, and we're very much in the game of prevention rather than cure. So it's simple things um, like when you're sat in traffic, just sitting up tall in your in your vehicle, what we call pelvic tilting, which is literally just rocking forwards and backwards from your pelvis. So you're loosening the lower back is, is quite a nice stress reliever in and around your lower back and, and just makes you feel a little bit more comfortable. I think one of the biggest tips I've given people um, over the years with regard to driver setup in the car is just adjusting the height of your rear view mirror. Because if you sit it, set it a little higher, you actually sit up more. Um, and so then making hint. sure, you know, that you are getting out of the vehicle as and when you can. And, we, you know, we appreciate that people that drive for business are often sat in traffic for long periods of time. Um, so that movement when you're in traffic or at traffic lights is, is vital to, to minimize the risk of, of those aches and pains. Because there's nothing worse than getting out of the vehicle at the end of a, of a long journey. Um, I'm feeling 90. Yeah, <laughs> I know that feeling. Which I do on a frequent basis. <laughs> no, yeah. no, that's not true. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so change change our rearview mirror. Make us stretch a bit more. Yeah, I'm going to do that as soon as I get back in my car. Yeah, the number of people that haven't thought about it, but it just makes you sit up more in order to be able to see out of your rearview mirror. Super. Thanks so much, Deb. Is there anything else yeah, you want to add, okay. Chris? No, that's it from me. I think next month we will be doing um, personal travel safety, if I'm right, Ellie, is that correct? And date to this be... This month, yeah, 24th. 24th of March. So, personal um, travel safety. And Ellie, are you aware if that's already on the website? Can people register already for that? Yes. Excellent. So if you go to posturite.co.uk forward slash webinars, um, you'll see um, not only a history of uh, all of our previous webinars, but also you'll be able to register for the one coming up later this month. So I hope to see you all there. Um, and um, everyone have a good weekend. So, thank um, you. Thank yeah, you, Eddie. Thank you very much, Debbie. Thanks very much.